Well, hi again. This is Dr. Silber Sherman Silber, the Infertility Center of St. Louis in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I'm going to be answering uh, questions and talking to you about infertility. Our website is uh, www.infertile.com. And uh, we're in St. Louis, and uh, we do this every month. And I think there are a lot of questions. I might just start out by saying that an article came out just uh, this week uh, in the uh, Wall Street Journal uh, that talked about how the U.S. population is declining. The population of young people is going down. Uh, it's about 1.7 births uh, per uh, Per, uh, couple and so that's not enough to replace the population and it may sound like a lot of mathematics to you but really what it means is we don't have enough young people uh, to uh, actually take care of the workforce they're going to pay for the retirement of uh, older people and this is a, a real bad sign for the economy you need to have uh, an even population or even some population growth for the country to maintain uh, its uh, economy. And so the problem is there's a lot of infertility. Infertility is way up, fertility is way down, and we're going to do whatever we can to try to solve that problem. Another interesting uh, note this week is there's been advertising for egg banks, for uh, women to freeze their eggs when they're younger so that even if they do put off childbearing, they'll be able to have fertile eggs to have uh, babies with. And in general, I feel that's a good thing, but uh, many women might be taken advantage of by entrepreneurial companies that are uh, perhaps not... Uh, going to be here tomorrow that are here today and uh, I think it's best to really get advice from your doctor about this. But it is a good idea uh, to uh, go to a fertility clinic and that knows how to do it right and get your eggs frozen while you're young before you turn 35 and the fertility of your eggs begin to go down and then you have to go to an IVF center because m most of our patients are over 35 because the common cause of this infertility epidemic is uh, that couples just in this modern, fantastic age we live in, they're putting off childbearing until they're infertile. So those are two of the things in the news I wanted to talk about, and I'm ready to answer questions, anything you have. Wonderful. And uh, so I wanted to start off with a couple of sort of generic questions that I get a lot of as, I, as we review Facebook and even on YouTube. But people always want to ask about how much IVF costs, and I know that that's not necessarily anything you can just broadcast, but what do you usually tell those people? Well, I'll tell you, the cost of IVF is a real, really important issue because most insurance companies don't pay for it. And except in a few states like Maryland, a uh, few states where it's required to be paid for, insurance doesn't cover it. So this is a, a big, important issue. The problem that patients have to face is it's very competitive, and infertility centers will often just... Uh, add one uh, test after another so it doesn't seem like it's that much at first but it could add up to fifty thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars and totally break a couple savings so our approach is to get to know to, to have a minimum of unnecessary testing uh, and to go right to the IVF with the least expensive approach. So that's why we do mini IVF and we have an absolute price. So by the time you pay for all your drugs and by the time you pay for your lab and uh, doctor's fees and anesthesia, uh, it could be uh, anywhere up to nine or ten thousand dollars, but uh, it can be twenty thousand or twenty five thousand dollars just for one cycle. Uh, if the fertility center isn't really cautious about your money. Makes sense. So we're going to start getting into some more of the specific types of questions. So Denise had asked uh, that she wants to know about the percentage, what percentage she has if she gets tubal ligation reversed at the age of 30 because she's ready to have another child, but she had a tubal ligation done when she was 24, so six years prior, and she had her tubes tied, cut, and burned. Okay, so most of the time when they tie the tubes, they cut them and burn them, and that's kind of routine. Uh, the question is, did they destroy the end of the tube, the fimbria, uh, or did they uh, do a like an e procedure just by putting an irritative uh, 
uh, coil into through the uterus because those things really can't be reversed. Uh, they're really a, they're really a mess. But frankly, we did the first uh, microsurgical tubal reversal in 1977 in the United States, and so we've got a vast experience of over three decades with this. And uh, at age 30, she should be quite fertile uh, with a proper reconnection. Uh, now she has a choice. I mean, she can she can do IVF as well. But many women, if we would prefer just to have the tubes reconnected microsurgically if it's done properly, because they have one operation and they don't have to go through hormones and possibly more than one cycle of IVF. So our results are fantastic. But if they took out your fimbriated end, we call it, that's the end of the tube near the ovary, well, then nothing can be done. It can't really pick up the egg. Or if they did what seemed like a simple procedure through the uterus, put this little coil into your uterotubal junction to scar it down, well, uh, that can't be reversed surgically, but you don't have to fear you can still get pregnant with IVF, but then tubal reversal wouldn't be your option. Yeah, and I think that's something that people might get scared about is they think that that's their only way forward, but it's nice to know that IVF is there for them. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, tubal reversal is very convenient if we can, uh, and it has to be done properly with microsurgery, but if that can't be done, then IVF is also uh, an alternative for them. Yep. Jill wants to know uh, what recommendations you have if the uterus, uterine, lining, uterine lining is not thick enough on Lupron and estrogen meds, an endometrial scratch has been done prior to this with the prior cycle, what would be the cause if other cycles the thickness has been fine? Well, okay, so uh, the question is endometrial thickness. Uh, the thickness of the endometrium is uh, overrated. Uh, what's most important is the structure. A, a triple layer and a proper looking on ultrasound, a proper looking endometrial lining is what's most important. Now, uh, I find anything that's greater than five millimeters is thick enough. Even five millimeters is thick enough. If you have a really beautiful, good, triple layer, ultrasound appearance that shows that the endometrial lining is healthy. Now when you, really, when you have a very thin lining, like uh, really less than five millimeters and no triple layer uh, and uh, scarring, that is often associated with having had an overzealous DNC or some kind of surgery or some kind of infection. So, frankly, the only approach then that's possible is just going on estrogen for a long time, not just for a week or two, but estrogen for three or four months to try to build up that endometrial lining. But I, I must caution, I, I really get bothered by the fact that uh, some GYNs, when they do the dilatation curatage or the DNC, they're very much over aggressive with it and, and the lining gets too thin and, and then it really, it really takes a lot of estrogen to make it recover. And if it doesn't recover, then your only alternative is a gestational surrogate. So uh, you talk about endometrial scratch. Well, if the scratch is done modestly the way it should be done, then we just give you a brand new beautiful uterine lining by virtue of the scratch. But if it's a overzealous DNC, then the lining could very well be damaged and, and might not recover. So uh, a uterine scratch, for those that don't know about it, is uh, often employed when someone hasn't gotten pregnant despite a good embryo being replaced. And there's a lot of controversy about how it works. One theory is that it causes inflammation that allows the embryo to implant. I don't buy that theory at all. Uh, the human uh, is the only animal that depends for implantation on a complete replacement of the uterine lining every month with menstruation. And it's a clean, complete replacement. So if something's wrong with that mechanism, the whole idea of the scratch is a mild curatage that gives you a brand new uterine lining next month uh, because you didn't menstruate in a way that gave you a lining that was receptive to embryo implantation. So a scratch is a bad term for it. It implies inflammation, but that's what we're really talking about. Uh, uterine scratch will not help a thin uterine lining. It will help 
uh, if you fail to get pregnant despite a good uh, embryo being transferred, and if you have a uh, hypertrophic thick uterine lining with a poor structure, that's what the scratch is useful for. Amazing. So thank you. Um, Allison is next, and she is 41 year. Uh, she was 41 at the retrieval. Um, let me explain a little bit about her case. She's doing a second frozen embryo transfer with PGS normal embryo. Her first FET ended in a blighted ovum, also PGS normal. And so these are from the same IVF cycle as well. Are my chances increased of having another blighted ovum since she had that first one? Well, first let's explain what PGS is. This is a, a very misunderstood phenomenon. So many IVF centers are insisting that the patient have the embryo biopsy, take cells out, and then look at it genetically. In fact, patients uh, almost expect that to happen now. What they don't understand is that it's in error so often, up to 40% of the time. So here, she had an embryo diagnosed as normal by PGS, and it wasn't normal. She obviously had a blighted ovum, and she wasn't gonna have a baby from that so-called normal embryo. Uh, so up to 40% of the time, you can diagnose the embryo in a different direction as abnormal, and then discard it or, or throw it away, and it might have been a baby. And that's because the cells that are biopsied, we call the trophectoderm, are the cells that are going to become the placenta eventually in the baby. And we've all known for decades and decades that placenta functions perfectly well with abnormal, chromosomally abnormal cells, aneuploid cells. So biopsying what's going to become the placenta is actually ridiculous. There is a little bit of a correlation with the what we call the inner cell mass or the uh, what will become the embryo, but the error rate is so high and the damage frequently caused by embryo biopsy is so great that uh, this is an overdone thing. I, I would reserve that for young women with lots of embryos that can afford to lose a few by virtue of an, of an incorrect diagnosis or damage to the embryo from the biopsy, uh, or sometimes if you're confused by recurrent miscarriage, it may give you a little bit more information. But otherwise, it's really, really overdone, and it, it's a money spinner. It's a way for the IVF center to make $5,000 more than they would have made for a regular IVF cycle. So uh, what I would recommend is go ahead and have your embryo transferred, see what happens, and if you don't get pregnant from that, then go through a cycle, what I recommend, of mini IVF to get the best quality embryos, and don't do this biopsy. You're being misled and fooled into thinking that somehow this is gonna increase your pregnancy rate. But our studies, even published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed that it decreases your pregnancy rate. It does not increase your pregnancy rate. So it's a terrible misnomer. It's a big money spinner, a billion dollar, or $15 billion a year industry, and you've been misled by it. Now you may get pregnant with this embryo. Just have it transferred and see what happens but you're 41, and if you don't get pregnant, you shouldn't waste any time doing IVF without PGS. That seems really tricky. That it, the PGS part sounds like something that would be explained to people to give them peace of mind when it's, it's really pretty much... It, it's, it's bogus, really. Well, I, I have dip, to tell yeah. you very bluntly, I, I was very careful about evaluating all the studies on it, evaluating what we found with it, and we've written papers on it, and we've been, we've been working on this field for 15 years, actually, and publishing on it. And so I'm very, I've been very cautious, but, but I think it's time not to be cautious anymore because it's so clear, uh, and it's true in all the animal studies you want to make, that the cells that you biopsy from the trophectoderm, which will become the placenta, so many of them are routinely abnormal, and the placenta functions perfectly well with 100% abnormal cells. Uh, so all you're doing is counting chromosomes. You're, you're not really doing genetic testing. You're not guaranteeing this is going to be a normal baby. Be all you're doing is counting chromosomes. And uh, so people think, well, this is great. You're going to, they say, you are going to check the embryo genetically, right, and make sure everything is normal. Well, that's not what's happening. You're just counting chromosomes. The error rate is up to 40%, and it lowers the pregnancy rate, lowers the baby rate, and uh, it doesn't really uh, make for a, a healthier baby. It, it's, a, it's a bogus thing. And so getting back to her question as well, I, I, even though I've been 
blessed at getting to work with you a lot. I don't know what blighted ovum means. Oh, okay. So all that means is that you had a fertilization of the egg uh, and that embryo implanted, but it was uh, destined not to live very long. And so we call it a blighted ovum. You could also call it a chemical pregnancy. Uh, I mean, your HCG went up, so you thought you were pregnant, but then it went down fairly quickly. And uh, uh, it, it's always caused by the embryo actually not being a viable embryo. And here it is. She had normal PGS. Supposedly this is going to be a normal embryo. And it wasn't a normal embryo. It was abnormal. It was able to implant, but it couldn't go any farther than implanting. And so, again, to, to kind of make sure we completely answer this question. So she's, she's trying to understand if the first has, this, has an effect on the second. But since, since we're comparing qualities that you can't really depend on, then... Well, the question is, because she had a blighted ovum, which is the same as not being pregnant, mm -hmm. with a transfer of a normal embryo, quote, normal embryo, Will, is she more likely to have the same problem happen again? Well, no, the, the prior experience isn't going to make the future experience more or less likely. She's 41 years old, and so naturally the viable pregnancy rate is not going to be as high as if she was 35 or 30 years old. Uh, the age of the egg is the most crucial factor in determining the likelihood of a, of a pregnancy and that goes on to delivery in a, in a baby. So, uh, but PGS is not going to help you with that. In fact, it hurts you because it, in many cases it does damage the embryo, but also the error rate is so ridiculously high. We see patients every day in our clinic that have been elsewhere and had a so-called normal embryo and uh, by, transferred and they never got pregnant, or they've had abnormal embryos that were thrown away and we actually think a lot of those embryos would have been a, a live baby. So it's, uh, it's, it's really a uh, terrible uh, misconception that's being pushed and pushed and pushed because of money spending, financial objectives, and it can be very disillusioning uh, for patients to realize this, but uh, there are very limited indications. If it's a young woman that can afford to lose some embryos, uh, she might uh, benefit a little bit from it uh, in terms of selection, but she, because she's going to have a high pregnancy rate no matter what. And many studies have shown, control studies, that for women under 38, uh, there's really no difference in, in result with uh, PGS or without PGS. But then for older women, who you'd think it would be good for to try to analyze if the egg is, or the embryo is any good or not, uh, it's even, it's worse because you throw away embryos diagnosed as abnormal, misdiagnosed that would have been babies. So the only indications are occasionally for young women, or there might be women that have had one, two, three, four miscarriages, and, and you'd like to have a little bit more information about the embryos. But otherwise, uh, they, they, should, they, they shouldn't get involved in that. But this woman is 41, so I would emphasize she shouldn't waste time while her egg is getting older. Do a mini IVF so we can get the best quality embryos and, uh, in fact, store up several of them and then do the embryo transfer and, and not um, uh, uh, meddle. I, I'll use the word meddle, not meddle with that embryo and, and hurt the embryo and make a false diagnosis. Thank you. I didn't mean to belabor that point, but I just oh, I think people need to know it because they bring it up all the time. It's one of the biggest controversies in our field now. Yeah. All right. Um, Isabel writes in and she says, we have an unexplained infertility. My husband takes diphenodrum... Spell it. Uh, well, it's di... I'm going to go slowly. Diphen hydramine in ZZ quill, so like NyQuil. Oh, uh, that's no sleep. big deal. It doesn't mean For anything. his night shift, does yeah. that affect his male fertility? No, that won't affect his male fertility. But, you know, uh, if there is a uh, male problem, that is a low sperm count or poor quality sperm, we can solve that easily with the way we do IVF. We, we do ICSI with every cycle. So we retrieve the wife's eggs, we inject them with the husband's sperm, the pregnancy rate, the baby rate, is just the same as if he had a completely normal sperm count. So it's very important not to, uh, uh, to do ineffective treatments on the male sperm uh, 
uh, while the wife's eggs are getting older and waste years and years and years. It's important uh, not to let the wife's eggs get older and to go into the treatment that's going to work. So male factor isn't the problem that it used to be because we ju just inject the sperm into the egg. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Caitlin has a question, and this one is probably a little bit more generic and not quite as specific as some of these others. My question is, does anyone do IUI unmedicated? The lowest dose of Clomid made me hyperovulate, so that doesn't seem like an option. Okay, so the question is about IUI, and you have to be medicated. IUI is another interesting uh, controversy. You know, I've been doing this for 45 years, and so that was before the days of IVF or IUI. I can tell you that intercourse, timed intercourse, is absolutely better than IUI because the egg after ovulation is only good for about eight hours. And uh, the sperm are good after entering the female tract for two to three days. So you always want to have sperm there for whenever you happen to ovulate because you'll never get the timing exactly right for the ovulation. So if you have intercourse uh, three times a week or four times a week or even every day, uh, then you'll always have some sperm there when you ovulate. And that's better than IUI because with IUI, you wash the sperm so that the semen doesn't cause a bad reaction when it's put in the uterus. And then you put that in the uterus and it goes up into the fallopian tubes and it's gone. It's gone. Three hours later, it's completely gone. You'll never get the timing right. You're better off having intercourse where the sperm invade the cervical mucus and they're gradually able to transport themselves up to the fallopian tube over the course of two or three days so that there's always some sperm present when you, when you ovulate. So the only reason IUI seems to work is it's combined with ovarian stimulation like the Clomid you were on. And you're right, if you're getting too much stimulation with the Clomid, you're just taking the risks of a multiple pregnancy. So, but IUI in itself is no better than timed intercourse. It seems like it's good only because it's combined usually with ovulatory stimulation. And if you can't have ovulatory stimulation because of a risk of a multiple pregnancy, then you really ought to just go to IVF. Because with IVF, we could transfer one or at most two embryos, freeze the extra embryos. You're at no risk of a dangerous multiple pregnancy and you, you solved your problem. And you, the timing is always right. The timing is so hard to get right with IUI but the timing is always going to be right with IVF. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so one of, our, one of our recent live questions here is uh, from Ms. Knight. She says, what is the process if you've already had eggs frozen? How much does it cost to do another cycle on trying to conceive? Okay, so they would have to thaw the eggs and fertilize them with your partner's sperm. And from then on, it's just like a regular IVF. Uh, the, uh, the cost varies from clinic to clinic. We're one of the least expensive there is because we, we use techniques that are more cost effective and more efficient. So for us, I, I don't remember the exact details, but a uh, egg freeze might cost somewhere around uh, two to four thousand uh, dollars, whereas in many centers it'd be fifteen to twenty thousand uh, dollars. And then when you thaw the eggs and you do the IVF transfer again, uh, it, it shouldn't be more than six or seven thousand dollars with us, but it would be, uh, I think, in many centers, uh, another fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. So freezing eggs isn't going to really usually save you money, but the idea is if you freeze your eggs when you're thirty, and you're not going to use them until you're forty, those will be much more fertile eggs. Right. Uh, the next question is from Courtney. She says, "Hi, Dr. Silber." When freezing embryos on day five, do you freeze them only if they make it to a blastocyst, blastocyst or do you freeze them at a lesser quality? Okay, so uh, what she's talking about is on day three after fertilization, the embryos are like a ball of cells, usually eight cells. And then they turn into a glob that's called a morula on day four, and then they turn into what's called a blastocyst on day five or day six. A blastocyst means you have this circle of what we call trophectoderm cells that will become the placenta, and what we call an inner cell mass that will become the actual fetus. And it just looks like it's a cyst, so we call it a blastocyst. And uh, so if it doesn't become a blastocyst by day five, we just culture it for another day or two. 
And if it becomes a blastocyst by day six or even day seven, of course you, you freeze it. And then if you transfer it with the right timing in a frozen cycle, on the equivalent of day five, the pregnancy rate has been shown by Shapiro et al. to be just as good. So uh, don't worry if it's not a blastus at day five. You, you wouldn't freeze it at a lesser stage. You would just culture it longer until it becomes a blastocyst. Um, LK asks, uh, well, let me, let me read it. Dr. Silber, I became pregnant naturally back in September. My doctor did not check anything but HCG. I miscarried, but I hear a lot about people saying that I should have progesterone levels checked. Is this true? Is this something I need to look into when I become pregnant again? Well, okay, so she's wondering. She got pregnant, but uh, just by a pregnancy test. Her do doctor apparently didn't bother doing an ultrasound. Normally, the ultrasound should show a fetal sac by five weeks of pregnancy. You should be able to see it. And by uh, six weeks, you should have a fetal heartbeat. And by seven weeks, you should have a, um, a, an actual normal fetal heartbeat and be relatively confident you've got a 95% chance that this pregnancy will be a good pregnancy and not miscarry. So he didn't do that. But uh, what is your chance of having this happen again? Well, it depends on your age, but for a woman in her 20s, there's about a 10% chance of miscarriage with every pregnancy. And that doesn't mean she's more likely to have a miscarriage with her next pregnancy. When a woman is in her late 30s, though, it's as high as a 25 or 30% chance of miscarriage. So uh, you just have to get pregnant again. Now, if you have a, a couple of pregnancies in a row that miscarry, then that is that unusual indication I was mentioning earlier where you may want to do IVF with PGS to see if you can figure out whether or not those embryos have a aneuploidy uh, defect all the time. But there are two, two basic issues with miscarriage. One is karyotype. You and your husband should make sure you don't have what's called a translocation. Uh, is, there's about a 2% risk that you have that. And if you have a translocation, then you probably ought to have IVF and PGS so that you don't transfer the embryo with a translocation. Uh, and the other possibility is a uterine abnormality. And with uh, ultrasound, and 3D ultrasound, we can see if the uterus is normal. If the uterus is normal, then I would give it a few more chances to get pregnant and carry before you uh, worry and go into IVF with PGS. I think I'm losing my voice here. I no. need a little water. Grab a glass of water. Um, while you were speaking, she did note that she was 31, but I think you kind of covered... She's 31? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a, a safe age, and I think at 31, uh, I wouldn't rush into treatment if she could get pregnant spontaneously. If she could get pregnant spontaneously at age 31, then I think the best treatment is just to get pregnant again, and the odds are still only about maybe 15 to 20% she'll get uh, have another miscarriage. All right. Brianna writes in. She says, hi, doctor. Can you speak to the MTHFR gene mutation and infertility? I was recently diagnosed and have miscarried four times with one failed IVF round. Well, so MTHFR is a, uh, it's a gene uh, that is related to folic acid metabolism. So if your only problem is MTHFR, it's very simple. You just go on high-dose folic acid replacement like uh, Folgard. Uh, you just, instead of regular prenatal vitamins, you go on vitamins that have a huge amount of folic acid. And frankly, if you have enough broccoli or green leafy vegetables in your diet, then you'll have enough folic acid. So that's all MTHFR is about. Now, but if she's had... Three mis was it three miscarriages or four miscarriages, one failed IVF round. Okay, so so that's actually not as not likely to be due to MTHFR. In fact, about fifteen percent of women have uh, a problem with an MTHFR defect, and most doctors would solve it by putting the patient on high doses of folic acid. So it's it's likely there's something else going on. So uh, this would be a case where to just clear up confusion, do IVF with PGS to see what the embryos are like. I know there's a lot of errors in it, but it, it might give you an idea if you have massive aneuploidy. 
But before you jump to that, 3D ultrasound to check for uterine abnormality and karyotyping, a very simple test you and your husband can have to see if there's a translocation because if you do and it's unbalanced, that would be a cause of recurrent miscarriage and that can be taken care of. Alejandro says, hello, I need to know how many treatments of IVF do you recommend before considering egg donation? Yeah, it depends on, on your age, actually. Uh, I wouldn't rush into egg donation if you're young. Uh, there could be uh, maybe the way your IVF was done wasn't the most optimal method. Uh, maybe there's some other problem like a uterine problem. Maybe, maybe uh, the lab wasn't so great. I, I don't know. I mean, people can have failed IVF cycles. But if it's an issue of age, and say you're 42 years old and you're not getting pregnant after three cycles, then sure, consider donor eggs. Now, now let me tell you something about donor eggs. Um, most women would want to have a baby with their own DNA. So that's why I urge you not to rush into donor eggs if you don't really need them, for your own uh, emotional feelings. But We've been doing donor eggs since 1986, and we've seen these kids grow up 32, 33 years of age, and uh, we don't have any unhappy patients who have had to resort to donor eggs. And I'll explain to you why. Um, it's easy to match physical appearance, race, ethnicity, background, um, and that's very easy to match that to a young donor. But what you can't match are five factors, personality, character, intelligence, emotional stability, and identification with you as parent. And uh, those five things are, are intangible, and you can't match them, but in fact they're not in the DNA. You see a kid at three years of age, and you have a good idea how that kid's going to grow up. It's true, you see it very early. But don't confuse that into thinking that it's because it's genetic. It's not genetic. It's how you interact with that baby in the first two or three years of life that determines everything. The foundation, personality, character, intelligence, emotional stability, and bonding with you. So uh, good bonding, good relationship, good interaction with the baby during the first two years of life is absolutely crucial and much more important than DNA. So if you need to go to donor eggs, then I wouldn't cry about it. Uh, I know we try to help women get pregnant with their own eggs because that's what they want. But if you can have a baby with your own eggs, I can assure you, you will be happy with your baby from donor eggs. Thank you. So Maddie writes in, she's 35. She has only one tube left due to a tubal pregnancy. She's tried Clomid, but it seems like nothing's working. I uh, um, also have a fibroid growing in the muscle of my uterus. The husband's sperm count wasn't perfect either and has 11-year-old already, but she's still interested in having another child. So she has a lot of issues. I mean, uh, she's had an ectopic pregnancy, meaning at least one tube wasn't functioning right. There's a good chance the other tube isn't functioning right either. And her child is 11 years ago, so she's obviously a lot older now, so her eggs won't be as fertile as they were when she got pregnant the first time. And uh, so she's got probably uh, some kind of subtle tubal problem. Her eggs are 11 years older, and she's got a fibroid. So I'd, most fibroids aren't a problem, but if it's four or five centimeters and or impinging on the uterine lining, that's got to be uh, removed before she is able to carry a baby. So, here's the right algorithm for that. I know she's older. I, she didn't reveal exactly her age, but she's 11 years older than she was. 35. She's 35. She's 35. Okay, she's 35 now. So, she's no longer 24. And so, the eggs aren't as fertile as they used to be, and she's probably got a subtle tubal disease, and there's a fibroid. I would recommend she go to IVF to get and get the embryos and freeze them now before her eggs get even older get her embryos, freeze them with vitrification so we won't hurt those embryos when we do that. At the same time, evaluate with all these ultrasounds the fibroid, whether it needs to come out. Then you can remove the fibroid if it's the type that has to be removed. It's not that difficult an operation. It's pretty easy. But I'd like her to heal for six months before we put the embryo in. So that's why I'd like to get her embryos first and freeze them 
before her eggs get even older than 35. And then we can relax and in, we have plenty of time to take care of the fibroid. She might even have a dilated tube on the other side if she's got tubal disease and that other tube might have to come out. So if you do IVF and you get the embryo and you freeze it, then you don't have to worry about it getting older and then you can take care of the other problems before you transfer that embryo back into her uterus. That's, it's always amazing to see how your mind works and how you just work through these things, but it's, it's really cool and helpful and I think it's helpful for everybody on the, on the yeah, broadcast. Yeah, you have to go in the right order. You have mm -hmm. to have the vision to think ahead and know exactly what order of events ought to take place. Yeah. Neck says, my cycle is 24 days. Uh, on the time that they wrote this, today is day number seven. I had similar ovulation cramps yesterday. Is it even possible for me to ovulate as early as day six? Oh, uh, that would really be, uh, I think that would be, I never say impossible, but that would be pretty remote possibility. 24-day uh, cycles are very frequent because normally it would be 27, 28 days. They might be longer, like 35 days, 40, 60 days with PCOS. So um, having cycles that are just uh, 24 days are, are fairly short. Um, I, uh, I, I don't think it's likely that those cramps are from ovulation. Now, I can't tell from what she said what's going on. We'd want to do an ultrasound, look at the uterus, and uh, that's going to give us our most information and evaluate her to see what ought to be done. I, I don't even know what the age is, you know. But um, if, I, if I had more information, now, if she'll write back, if you will write back mm -hmm. and give us more information about yourself, then I can maybe give you a better algorithm what to proceed with. And I may have to re out, reach out to her. She was on, she had responded to one of your other videos, so I wanted to make sure that question got answered. Okay. Um, Mindy says, what are your beliefs regarding weight slash obesity um, and seeking treatments? Do you have a set limit? Yeah. Well, it, we don't have an absolute set limit, but for, uh, just last week I saw uh, two women that had an obesity problem. One weighed 400 pounds and a very happy woman, but she wanted to lose that weight. And uh, if we try to get her to lose weight with dieting, it might never happen. And uh, in fact, it might take two or three years even, and then she'd fail and her eggs would be older because she was 35. So you don't want the eggs to get older, but you certainly don't want to do IVF on someone who weighs 400 pounds. It'll be very, very difficult. Uh, then on the, the same day, I saw a woman who had weighed 400 pounds. This was just last week. It's interesting. And uh, she had a gastric banding operation through the laparoscope, and now she's 180 pounds, and she's a perfect candidate for IVF, and it won't be any problem. Not only that, weighing 400 pounds is so dangerous, uh, you're not going to have a long life with that weight, so you have to do something about that. So um, I recommended to the 400-pound lady that uh, she have the gastric banding procedure, she will lose a dramatic amount of weight, and, uh, and then we'll go ahead with IVF. We don't want to wait too long while her eggs are even getting older. But you know, it's frustrating when you tell, fertility doctors often tell patients you better lose weight. Uh, lose 60 pounds or 100 pounds and then come back. Patients are very uh, upset and offended by that because the massively overweight patient is probably not eating any more than their partner is. They're at a steady state. I mean, they're not eating more. Unless, if they're eating more than the partner, then they're gaining weight. But if their weight is staying steady at something like 400 pounds, that means, or 300 pounds or whatever, that means that they've been that way for a long, long time. And the only way you lose that weight is by starving, by eating less than your partner. And that's very, very hard to do. So it's really, really hard to hold your weight down. And uh, I, I don't do this, this kind of work. I'm, I'm not a, uh, uh, a bariatric surgeon. But I found by counseling these patients with infertility and, and talking to so many thousands of them that um, if they're really massively obese, they probably ought to have the bariatric surgery and get it taken care of as best as possible, as quickly as possible, before the eggs get older. Now, if someone's moderately overweight, I don't think that has any impact at all on her pregnancy rate. If she has a BMI that's, that's too high, but it isn't massive, I haven't seen that it has a negative effect on pregnancy, and we just go ahead with IVF. But um, 
uh, if it's massive obesity, I, I think you they got to lose the weight. Thank you. The uh, the chats pretty much answered or uh, had all their questions answered. I have one more question that I had from our list from previous videos. Um, Gagan has the question. I'm a patient of hypogonotropic hypogonadism. Yeah. And wants to know what his percentage of fertility or ch well, it's, it's called hypogonadotropic hypopituitarism. That means that uh, his pituitary gland is not making the FSH and LH necessary to stimulate his testicle uh, to make sperm. It could be caused by Kalman syndrome. It could have been caused by, say, a, a cranial injury in which the pituitary gland was injured. Uh, it's not that common, but we, uh, we do see that kind of problem all the time. Now, there should be no problem uh, getting his testicle to make sperm if he replaces FSH and, and HCG. And normally we'd give him FSH uh, 150 IU three times a week and HCG maybe 1500 uh, IU three times a week. But it takes a long time. It could take uh, nine months or even a year before we see sperm in the ejaculate. As soon as we see sperm, it won't be a real high count. He'll never have a high count, never. But if there's any sperm, we freeze it, and then he'll obviously have to be on testosterone because otherwise he's, he's going to be a eunuch. But we've got his sperm frozen now, and then we do IVF and we do ICSI injecting the, his sperm into his wife's eggs, and we'll have a normal pregnancy rate doing that. All right, so somebody must have gotten tipped off that we were kind of wrapping things up, but then we snuck in one more question. Um, Ms. Knight says, hi again. So if I have an embryo already frozen with the fertility clinic, and she wants to take them somewhere else to do IVF. Is that possible? Oh yeah, uh, we have that happen all the time. Uh, you it, maybe you're not comfortable with the way they did the first transfer. For some reason, they don't make you comfortable. Uh, you can always, at least with us, you can always have your embryo sent here, and we'll do the we'll do the thaw and we'll do the embryo transfer, and we'll evaluate that embryo if it's a good embryo or not a good embryo at the time we do it. So, uh, yeah, we do that all the time. Uh, FedEx has a standard uh, policy for this, and there are dry shippers, we call them, and uh, it's, uh, it's something that is easily done. Thank you. That pretty much wraps it up for tonight's broadcast. Do you have any kind of final comments? Yeah, so I'd just like to say I, uh, I'm happy to answer all these questions. Obviously, uh, with limited information, I can't give you the most definitive answers, but I can give you some idea how you can carry your research further and realize the most important thing that you're facing is the clock. And uh, you don't want to waste a lot of time with ineffective treatments uh, while your eggs are getting older because then your uh, success rate, even with IVF, will be more difficult. Uh, and I would encourage you to freeze your eggs, but the problem is you don't want to freeze them with uh, some uh, fly-by-night place that is just an entrepreneurial uh, quick business. You, you want to really have it done properly and professionally because otherwise you'll have a sense of security that is a false sense of security. The eggs need to be frozen correctly. So, okay, I, I should say, so this is uh, Sherman Silver, Dr. Silver. Uh, I'm signing off now this month. Uh, we'll see you again next month. Uh, our website is infertile.com, and you can always uh, call us at any time in St. Louis, and we'll answer your questions at no charge.